Hello and welcome to this joint production between People's Dispatch and Pan African Television. Today we are going to be talking about Ghana, a country which has faced a severe economic crisis for many months now. Inflation has been sky high, prices have been rising, especially of essentials. In the meantime, the government has now, that is on the 13th of December, signed an agreement with the International Monetary Fund for a loan of 3 billion US dollars. Of course, the deal has to be approved by the IMF's board in Washington. But this is Ghana's 18th deal with the IMF. And we do know that Ghana is not alone. A number of countries across the world caught in the IMF web, so to speak. Every country has its own unique situations, but each many countries are also quite similar. So to talk more about this, we have with us a very special guest, Kwesi Prat Jr., General Secretary of the Socialist Movement of Ghana. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. So first of all, my question is about this deal itself before we go into the deeper economic questions. Uh, how do you think Ghanaians are responding to the news of this deal. It has been in the works for a long time, a lot of discussion about it. What has been the response now that it's been finalized? Well, nobody believes that this is the solution to the hydra headed problems that confront the Ghanaian people. The president himself doesn't believe that there's an answer to the economic crisis. Nobody believes this. He himself has been talking about the need to fundamentally restructure the Ghanaian economy because he sees the problem as a structural problem. The opposition has insisted that this is no solution to the Ghanaian problem and so on. Now, what is happening is that something has to be done. They quite don't know what to be done, so anything must be done in order to deceive the people. And that's why they, they come up with this so-called deal, which is going to give us $3 billion over a three-year period, and for which government has to implement a number of very, very harsh measures and so on. Now, for me, one of the things which is most significant is the fact that this is the 18th time that Ghana is going to the IMF. We've gone there 18 times. And every time we go there, the problems remain unsolved. In 1983, we went to the IMF and the World Bank. And uh, we reached a staff level agreement as we have reached today. Eventually, the board of the IMF and the World Bank approved, you know, some arrangement for us, the structural adjustment program and so on. What was the effect? In less than three months, 300,000 workers lost their jobs. We had to privatize more than 400 state enterprises. In the end, cumulatively, the Ghanaian city has been devalued by more than 30,000%. Uh, we privatized social services like health and education and, and, and so on. I mean, had clearly very disastrous consequences for people. That model has not changed. That is the new model, neoliberal part to economic development. Always comes with more disaster, more hardship for the population, and we are not expecting anything new. Now, for us to reach this state, government had to take a number of measures. Uh, one of the measures was to inc increase the value-added tax you know, by 2.5% or thereabout. Uh, government is, is, is insisting on, on what it calls a debt exchange program, which simply means that interest on, on, on government loans, loans the government has taken from the private sector, from individuals and so on, would not be paid over a period of time. Which is going to have devastating consequences on the pension schemes of right. workers in the public sector and so on. Um, in addition to that, there's a freeze on public sector employment, which means that the unemployment problem is not going to get solved and so on. So people are generally very, very apprehensive. People know that this is not a solution. They know it's going to bring about more hardship. And it appears that sections of the society are mobilizing for mass action. The Trade Union Congress, for example, has threatened to embarrass upon industrial action. And the Trans Union Congress of Ghana has a membership of about 500,000 workers. The Ghana Medical Association has threatened. Ghana Registered Nurses Association has threatened. Various teacher organizations are threatening. It appears that if care is not taken, this country will be grinding to a halt very soon. Right. In this context, every time the IMF comes, the discussion about the IMF comes in various countries, the question everyone asks is, how do we get there? And we know that there's been a trajectory of policies. You mentioned 
uh, part of the trajectory where earlier agreements with the IMF actually seem to have caused, you know, uh, it seems to have started off a process which has brought Ghana today. But one thing I believe you also, in one of our earlier interviews, you talked about, which is the fact that Ghana is a, a vast uh, reserve of resources, some very valuable resource at this point of time. So often a question asked is that despite all these resources, how did the country end up in a situation like where it is today? So what would the answer be to that? Well, now struggle for national independence, we had three clear objectives. First of all, we wanted the opportunity to determine our, our political structure, our political future, and so on. And we also wanted an opportunity, therefore, to elect our own leaders. But in addition to that, we wanted to struggle, you know, to break from the colonial yoke and so on, primarily because we wanted to own our own resources. And we wanted to exploit these resources for the benefit of our people. These objectives of the independence movement have not been achieved. So we have built uh, a new colonial economy, which still makes it impossible for us to own our resources, and we still makes it impossible for us to exploit these resources for our benefit. Now, you're looking at a country like Ghana with a population of about 30 million people, 31 million people. And the facts are that Ghana is the second largest producer of cocoa in the world, the whole world. Ghana is the sixth largest producer of gold in the whole world, you know, and recently Ghana became the first, the largest producer of gold in Africa. Ghana has bauxite, iron, it has oil, it has gas, you know, it has vast amounts of water resources with rivers crisscrossing the country and emptying into the Atlantic Ocean. We are bordered in the south, actually, by the Atlantic Ocean. It does not make any sense that a country with this enormous amount of resources is not able to feed itself. A country which exists in the tropics, which actually lies on the equator, is not able to feed itself. It simply doesn't make sense, you know. And it doesn't make sense when we are told that gold resources can be used you know, to back up the national currency. Russia has used it effectively right. over the last couple of months and so on. And yet our currency is one of the worst performing currencies in the world. I mean, all of this doesn't simply make sense. What is happening is that all of these resources that we have are currently not owned by the people of Ghana, and they are certainly not being exploited for the benefit of the people of Ghana. And one of the areas we can look at is, is gold. I mean, if you look at the gold industry in Ghana, you would marvel. First of all, we are giving huge tax holidays to gold mining companies. Mm -hmm. I mean, recently, Dr. Sandrona, who was the first chief executive of Andrew Gold Ashanti, actually told us that Ghana has no interest in the largest gold mine in the country, one of the biggest gold mines in Africa, Angu Gold Ashanti, we have no interest at all, you understand. And uh, we have also signed very ridiculous agreements with some of these mining companies. And one of the most ridiculous agreements we signed with the mining companies is what they call the Foreign Exchange Retention Agreement. Now, under this agreement, mining companies are free to retain sometimes up to 98% of the value of gold exported from Ghana outside the Ghanaian economy. Why would we not run into this kind of trouble? We certainly will be running into these kinds of trouble if we do not take measures to own these resources and to exploit these resources for our own benefit. Now, again, I think it's important for us to understand in clear terms that the primary objective of private capital is to double itself. The primary objective of private capital is to make more profit. Right. Private capital is not interested in, in improving nutrition. It only improves nutrition or contributes to improving nutrition if that would increase its capacity to make profit. Private capital is not interested in improving the standard of education if it is not going to contribute to maximizing profit and so on. So the profit motive itself is a, dis is a dis disincentive to the mobilization of our people 
to resolve the concrete problems that confront us. And I think that's important for us to begin to move away from this capitalist mode of development, yeah. to move away from this neoliberal agenda, which increasingly continues to impoverish our people. Absolutely. In this context, I also just quickly wanted to ask you about debt, because that seems to be one of the factors which is cited in many reports as a crucial uh, you know, problem that is affecting Ghana. So could it also tell me a bit about why the country seems to be in such massive levels of debt? Well, the levels of debt are, are shocking. We owe so much to the extent that now we need to expend more than 100% of total national revenue on three line items, debt servicing, debt repayment, and public sector emoluments. Right. And these three items require about 120% of total national revenue. That's an impossibility, you understand? So the hole keeps getting deeper and deeper, and we, we are still digging, we are still acquiring more loans. Under this so-called agreement to the IMF, they are supposed to be giving us $3 billion over a period of three years, but it's not a gift. We have to pay for it, okay. you understand? So we are just increasing the debt. Right. Huh? Now, how come that the debt keeps growing? The debts keep growing because we are not engaged in any sensible production. We are not producing anything. We are importing toothpicks. We are, the, the, the elite in our society no longer drink Ghanaian water. They import Ghanaian water. We are importing our clothes. We are importing vehicles. We are, we are virtually importing everything that our people depend on. That's not production. Okay, so the pressure on the local currency increases all the time because you need more dollars to bring in biscuits, you need dollars to bring in soft drinks, you need dollars to bring in secondhand clothing, and so on. There's massive pressure on the city, and we are not producing anything because, and, and so anytime the city goes under pressure, we borrow in order to strengthen the city. You understand? Anytime we need more rice, we borrow to produce rice. And rice production is one interesting area. This country, huh, all the 16 regions of Ghana have tremendous potential for producing rice. You understand? And the nutritionists even tell us that locally produced rice is far more nutritious than imported polished rice. Right. And yet, we are spending billions of dollars per annum bringing in rice simply doesn't make sense when there are favorable conditions in the country for the cultivation of rice. Absolutely. You know, and it goes with all others. Mm -hmm. I mean, we are in the tropics, okay? The rainfall pattern is good. Mm -hmm. We are okay. Do you know that we are the third largest importer, third largest importer of tomato paste from Germany? <laughs> Well, we have better conditions in our country for the cultivation of tomatoes than Germany. Mm -hmm. Guinea fowls, which is the Ghanaian delicacy, I mean, it's, it's, it's a fowl which, which, is, which, which has very little fat, you know, and so on. Ghana has now become dependent on Denmark for the importation of guinea fowls. You understand? <laughs> we are importing eggs. We are importing tomatoes from, from, from sunny, sunny, arid lands and so, and so on. Simply doesn't make sense. We built the Akosumbu hydroelectric project in the early 1960s and created the largest man-made lake in the world, okay? The Volta River flows all the way from Burkina Faso through all parts of Ghana, creates the largest man-made lake in the middle and pours into the Atlantic Ocean. And we are importers of fish. We are bordered on the south by the Atlantic Ocean, and we are importing fish. Simply doesn't make sense. This country needs to begin to think about how to utilize the many resources it has to address the concrete problems of its people, and thereby limit its dependence, especially on the dollar and foreign currency, in order to solve its, its problems of, of, of food, its problems of access to housing, and so on. You understand? Now, if you look, President, if you look at, 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 at 
the rate at which prices are escalating. Mm -hmm. It is completely crazy. I mean, within the last six months, the price of petroleum products have more than doubled, okay? The staple that is eaten by their crowd people, the kinky, used to sell for one CD a ball. Within the last 12 months, it is now selling for five CDs a ball. It's increased 500%. How can the people cope with this crisis? You know, and then we are told sometimes that, look, we, we needn't worry. It's a worldwide phenomenon. Everybody is suffering Ukraine the war same. that's causing it, yes. Everybody <laughs> is, is facing the same problem. Right. If everybody is facing the same problem, it simply means that we are all doing the wrong thing. Exactly. The fact that everybody is facing the same problem doesn't make what is happening in Ghana right. Absolutely. And sometimes, worse still, we are told that the problem is caused by the Russia-Ukraine war. Can you believe that Ukraine, where the bombs are falling, its currency is doing better than the Ghanaian currency? So that's a useless excuse. They should stop telling us about the Ukraine-Russian war and so on, because in Ukraine, which is receiving the bombs, is doing much better than, than, than we are doing. It simply doesn't make sense. Absolutely. And then we are told that COVID-19 is also responsible for the current crisis and so on. Is COVID-19 the reason why we have signed the foreign exchange retention agreements with the mining companies? Certainly not. COVID-19 is not the reason why we are interest in our own mining operations is zero. COVID-19 is not the reason why it's not the reason why we are dependent on Germany, you know, for, for our tomato needs. COVID-19 is not the reason why we are not using the Akoso go down to farm fish. COVID-19 is not the reason why we are not getting maximum benefits out of, out of, out of, out of, out of the cocoa industry. The second largest producer of cocoa. And look at the poverty around us. COVID-19 simply cannot explain this condition. Right. So finally, of course, the question I ask, uh, almost every guest who comes on our show, it's basically that you analyze the problems that lead to it. One interesting aspect about many countries which are in a similar situation is that both the ruling party and the opposition seem to be in a in almost a bankruptcy or a crisis of alternatives because both of them, of course, criticize each other, but finally they both end up going to the IMF for perpetuating the same policies. So. From the perspective of the left in Ghana, from the perspective of many of the movements you were talking about earlier, who have been, you know, raising slogans, who have been sort of expressing their opposition, what might be some of the concrete steps that might help alleviate this crisis at this point of time? You're right. I mean, <laughs> all the governments have gone to the IMF and the World Bank, and at, at any given time, the opposition has said no to IMF and World Bank. As soon as they come to power, They've cleared the path towards the boardrooms of the IMF and the World Bank. Indeed, the current government in Ghana said that it was unpatriotic to go to the International Monetary Fund. In fact, they actually said that it would be reckless to go to the International Monetary Fund and so on. Now they're in power, they're also headed to the IMF and, and, and so on. So there's a certain level of insincerity when it comes to these parties which alternate you know, in, in, in government and so on. Now, clearly, these governments do not appear to have any answer to the problems that confront our people. Right. They've been doing this for 60 years. This is the 18th time we are going to the IMF. And you know, the, the popular saying by Einstein. <laughs> I was thinking of that. <laughs> <laughs> the popular saying by Einstein, that if you keep on doing the same thing all the time and you're expecting different results, you need to have your head examined. <laughs> now, we've been doing the same things for 60 years and we're expecting different results, right. which ain't going to happen. You understand? So we need to think anew. And if we need to think anew, the formula we have to adopt is to find out what we have, uh -huh. how to maximize you know, uh, income, how to maximize the benefits of what we have, in order to address the concrete problem that faces the Ghanaian people. How to make sure the Ghanaian people have food on the table, 
how to make sure that access to education improves, yeah. how to make sure that when our people fall sick, they get treatment and so on. This is how we have to approach the economy. <laughs> the economy is not about figures. It's not about the gross domestic product. It's not about per capita income. It's not about debt to GDP ratio and so on. Right. The economy ought to be concretely about the lives of our people, how to improve the lives of our people. Yeah. And if the economy is doing well, citizens must feel it. You know, the contentment of citizens must be the measuring rod right. when it comes to looking at the national economy. And uh, I am convinced that these bourgeois political parties and so on have no solutions at all. Mm -hmm. And I'm happy that uh, general mobilization in Ghana appears to be getting a boost. Mm -hmm. Organized labor is mobilizing. Uh, all kinds of fronts are mobilizing. I think it's time for the left movement in Ghana right. to clearly identify with all of these movements which are agitating for, for, for a better and new option to economic development and to participate in these struggles until we get to the point where we shall begin to look for indigenous solutions to our problems, right. not solutions which end up increasing the, 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 the wallets you know, of those who sit in the boardrooms of the multinational corporations in the colonial metropolis. Absolutely. And I think it's possible. I think ultimately we shall emerge victorious in this battle against underdevelopment and neoliberalism. Absolutely. Thank you so much for speaking to thank us. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So there we have it, a tough couple of months and even years maybe ahead for the people of Ghana. And many other countries, like I said earlier, facing a very similar situation as well. The ruling class might tell all of us that there really is no option. The IMF is the only way to go. These policies are the only options to solve the crisis to some extent. But I think the question we all need to ask perhaps is that, is that really the case? Are there other alternatives? That might go much a much farther way. That might be much better to actually solve some of these crises that we in many countries fail. That's all we have time for today from People's Dispatch and PATV. See you next time.